Hello. In this video I'm going to explain how Pygame Zero and GPIO Zero can be used together to combine electronic circuits and sensors with the Raspberry Pi and the official Raspberry Pi touchscreen. Through this you can create graphical displays such as the bar graph and speedometer display shown here. I've also created an image of a clickable house which when clicked lights up LEDs on a 3D printed model house and even starts a smoke generator. I'll show this at the end of the video. You don't need much to get started. The touchscreen is optional and it can be run on any Raspberry Pi with just a few basic electronic components. The video is designed for beginners, ideally for someone who has a bit of experience with basic Python programming, but I'll be covering wiring on the breadboard in both GPIO Zero and Pygame Zero. Don't worry if that sounds a bit basic, as I've included chapters in this video, so if you're just interested in how I created the speedometer, bar graph or how I control the smoke coming out of the model house then take a look at some of the later chapters of this video. The chapters should be shown on the video timeline or see the video description for the timings. This first part of the video is based on a workshop I ran at the UK 3D printer meetup during 2019. During that I ran a workshop and created a worksheet explaining this. I've made a few changes in the source code, specifically for the Raspberry Pi touchscreen, but if you prefer to follow through a worksheet rather than follow through the video, then that's fine. Don't forget to check towards the end of this video where I add some of the fun features. The source code is included on my website for all of the examples shown. This is the setup that you would create following the video. It's really just a demonstration about what could be done and to teach you the basics of creating the electronics and the interface and communicating between the two. At the end I'll show some ideas of how you can develop that into your own maker projects. This is the circuit diagram that I'll be creating on the breadboard. It's a good idea to download this worksheet to be able to have this in front of you when you follow along. If you're familiar with electronics and create a circuit on a breadboard then feel free to skip this chapter and get onto the coding aspects. I'm going to wire up the circuit. We've got a Raspberry Pi which is mounted onto the a Raspberry Pi touchscreen, 7 inch wide touchscreen. This is the uh, Pimeroni uh, touchscreen case that it's mounted in, which is a little stand. It's a Raspberry Pi 4 in there, uh, but you can do this with any Raspberry Pi at all. Then the breadboard. This breadboard is mounted on a breadboard stand, which I designed and I've created a separate video on this showing how it's created in Tinkercad. Uh, the main benefit of this is these four millimeter sockets, which can be used with banana plugs. They're not re needed for this circuit. They can still be useful for testing purposes because you can connect these to a multimeter by inserting a wire into these and wiring them onto the board, but they're not really needed. So if you wanted to just use straight onto a breadboard, that would be absolutely fine. So I'm going to add the switches. In this case, these are simple push button switches, which are designed to be mounted directly to a printed circuit board or useful for the breadboard. These ones are colored red and blue to correspond with the color of the LEDs. They're going to be lighting up on the screen when we get to the coding part. As you can see, the buttons caps can be taken on and off. They, you do get different kinds of buttons and different kinds of cap. But it's not needed, you can just wire these straight on to the breadboard. It doesn't matter whether they're coloured or not. These can go in any position on the breadboard, but I'm going to follow the positioning I've used in the diagram. And you just need to give these a really good push to get them on. You may need to just adjust the button slight the position of the pins slightly but these have been in and out of various breadboards. So these ones hopefully should line up. So as you can see, they've gone in like that. I have put these very close together on this one. Uh, so it may be that you're wanting to spread those out a bit, uh, but I've just done these to uh, to give me plenty of space up the other side. Now the way that these work is these are pushed to make 
which means that they're open and they should press the button in which case it makes the connection and closes the button in most of these and you, you have to just check the specification the left hand side and the right hand side are wired together so there's four pins the two on the left is one connection the two on the right is the other connection when you press that it joins the two sides together we can just quickly check that with a multimeter let's get that here and i'm just going to put this on the buzzer continuity tester mode so it's, it's the one that shows the resistance ohms and then i just turn on the buzzer and there we go so we can see if they're connected they beep if they're not then they don't as you can see at the moment if i go side to side there's no connection but if i go top to bottom on the same side there is a connection now if i press down while holding those you can see as long as i go side to side or diagonally across then there is a connect then that's based on the button so, so that quick check I know that I can wire those up which is corresponds with the diagram now with this I'm going to use this uh, blue line here as a common earth ground earth connection we can just use jumper wires so if you're getting started in using some breadboarding then you might want to use these jumper wires and these are pre-terminated with male connectors sometimes called DuPont wires the DuPont's a particular manufacturer though so um, otherwise just look look for jumper wires but as you can see if you start to put these on these do take up quite a bit of space and the untidy wires makes it hard to get to the switches but I, I often use these just for if I'm just wanting to make up a quick circuit test whether something works um, so they are quite useful but I'd rather have something a little bit neater here so I'm going to use some ready-made wires I've got I've got a jumper kit here which is perhaps a bit over the top but it's a whole selection of different size jumper wires. These aren't all the original ones. Some of the ones have I've added and made myself. And there's some nice little tiny ones here that I can do, which mean I can make a connection and the wire just stays out of the way. So I'll see if I've got the black one so if you don't have one of these kits and they're quite useful but they're perhaps it's quite useful because it's got a selection of lots of different colors but it doesn't necessarily have the right lens and you have to cut to lens anyway these ones actually by the looks of it that i've made myself so you might be better off with such a, a selection of, of different colored wires such as this one if you're going to do with the breadboard and just strip the wire cut to length and strip again and you can you can get a bundle of, of different colors the important thing is to make sure they're solid wires they're not stranded wires stranded wires won't really go into the breadboard these need to be solid core wires the next components we're going to look at are the leds i'm going to use a green yellow and red just three different colors which are quite common you can use any color you want obviously this is good if you wanted to do a traffic light type system they're the natural colors but if you prefer to do something else that's fine they have a positive and a negative side to an led the positive is known as the anode and that has to be connected to the positive rail of the positive side of the power supply and the cathode is the negative and the the current will flow from the anode to the cathode if you connect it the other way around then no current will flow at all the anode is usually the longer pin in this case you can see here that 
one pin is slightly longer than the other. Not always obvious, but usually that's the, the best way of telling. It's worth just giving a quick check if you've got uh, a resistor and a, and a battery, just have a quick check to make sure you've got the right way around. Or you can just put it in the circuit and if it doesn't work, then you can uh, turn it around. But not all of them have different lengths, particularly if they've been cut out of something else or been used before. Usually they will have a flat side. You're not going to be able to see it on this in the in the video, but there's a tiny little, instead of, if you look at end on, instead of being perfectly circled, there's a slight flat part which corresponds with a cathode or the negative side as well. So I'm going to pop these on. So the, the cathode, the negative, the shorter leg goes on this blue line and the rest, it goes into the appropriate position. Again, the, the exact position doesn't matter. So as long as you see each of the columns are connected together, as long as it goes into the appropriate column, then that's fine. And then finally the red one. Okay, so there's the, the three LEDs connected in there. And next to the resistors into these. So these are 220 ohm resistors, which are indicated by the color banding. So red is two, 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 and then the, the brown indicates that there's one zero after that, so the 220, and then the gold is the tolerance. 220 ohms is very common for use on Raspberry Pi GPIOs. This is to limit the current. In my book, Learning Electronics with Raspberry Pi, I have explained how I've calculated this, and I'm sure this will uh, end up as a feature on my website or a video at some point, but the, the calculations isn't very difficult. But these are a really useful size, so it's, it's really useful just to buy lots and lots of these. They come on strips, I've just taken three of them off here. So just take these off here. Now it doesn't matter which way around these go, and there's no positive or negative, it's exactly the same, which way around. So if I just bend the legs here and put these in, it doesn't matter which particular pin, as long as it's the same column as the LED. So we just put that in like that. Now, as you can see, if we just leave them with the legs at the full length, these are going to stick up quite proud. Doesn't really matter for this, we're just going to put three resistors here. However, just as we did with these wires, it's nice if we want to keep it nice and tidy, then you can just cut these off. On some components, you probably don't want to do this because it gives you more flexibility by having keeping the, the wires nice and long. You can use them in multiple circuits and things like that, or keep making the different circuits up with them. But these resistors then really don't cost much at all, and it does make it a little bit nicer and neater if you just snip off the legs like that and then push those firmly in as you can see it, it's more or less flush with the breadboard now so it looks a little bit neater so if i just do that for all three just cut those two to whatever length um, they're not exactly lined up but that, that's good enough for a breadboarding environment 
And then the final thing is to connect these from the breadboard to the Raspberry Pi GPIO ports. For that, I'm going to use jumper wires. Let me just tidy those away. So these are the jumper wires I'm going to use. I've got quite long ones here. So these are about 30 centimeters or one foot, 12 inches long. And these are male at one end and female at the other. So these are sometimes known as DuPont cables, DuPont connectors, um, or they're just known as terminal as uh, jumper wires. And we need the male end because that will plug into the breadboard and then the female end will go into the Raspberry Pi and you get these as a, a as a big bundle I've just taken these ones off because these are the ones I need so we take a look at the Raspberry Pi here and we'll wire these up based on this so the only difference between the wiring because of the the way that these are uh, colored um, I haven't got a black one. There, there would have been a black one, but it, it wouldn't have been able to do them all, get them all together, which isn't a problem. Individual wires is fine, but it's also quite, uh, I think it looks quite neat if you can try and keep the wires together as much as possible. So the ground is first, which goes on pin six. We number one, two, three, four, five, six. And then switch one, which I'm going to use orange because I'm going to use red for the red LED, is going to pin number three. So that's the second pin on the bottom row. The blue switch, we use the blue wire, which is going to go to pin five, which is right next to the orange wire. Then green to pin 11. The yellow pin 13, the next one along. And lastly, the red to pick 15. So just all three along from each other. Now those pin numbers are the physical pin numbers. So that's counting from, from pin one with odd numbers along. You normally have it this way around, but for the thing, for the uh, display, it's the other way around. So the odd numbers along the bottom and the even numbers on the top from pin one to pin 40. Some of the older ones have less pins, but still use the same principle. And then these connect to the appropriate pins on the Raspberry Pi, on the breadboard. So brown was ground, red for the red. So you, need, you will need to separate these a little bit. Red for the red LED. Orange for there. Blue for the blue switch. And then yellow for the yellow LED. And then that's the wiring complete. So now we're onto the software side for the Raspberry Pi. We can now power it up and start programming this using Pi Game Zero and GPIO Zero, which is going to control the GPIO ports. So here I've got the breadboard all wired up. I've powered on the Raspberry Pi. It's got the normal Raspberry Pi OS image on it. The only thing I had to do was to flip the screen because the uh, screen is mounted upside down that you can adjust that and now onto 
the coating side, which is the main part that I'm wanting to show in this video. This is the interface I'll be creating in Pygame Zero. It's a simple interface with three virtual buttons which turn the physical LEDs on and off, and two virtual LEDs which are controlled from the physical button switches on the Raspberry Pi. So before we get started, I'll just explain how we turn the screen around if you're using this particular stand. You only need to do it uh, for certain stands. It depends on the orientation of the screen. Uh, first, how not to do it is through the screen configuration tool. So here's the screen configuration tool, which is useful if you've got multiple regular screens on the HDMI connections, such as if you're using a Pi 4 with two HDMI outputs. But if you try and use this to flip the screen on the, the DSi touchscreen, the screen will flip, but the controls won't. So you'll have to touch in the wrong corner, which is just, just doesn't work. So the place to do it, and I've already done it on here, but I'll, I'll just show you, is through the slash boot slash config.txt file. And on here, I'll just use um, sudo to edit it as root, mouse pad, which is the default text editor these days in Raspberry Pi OS, and then the name of the file. And you can see um, this is the entry, LCD underscore rotate equals two. You just need to add that, reboot, and then the screen will flip upside down and you'll be able to use the touch screen as it's intended. So you just save and Then in this, I'm going to use the Mu editor. Uh, this is a, a nice, easy to use editor, which works really well with Pygame Zero. And if you've done a full install, as I've done, and I've also added a few other things as well, but you'll see it already appears on the menu. If you did the regular install, so just use the standard image in the Raspberry Pi imager, then that won't be installed. So if you haven't got it installed, I'll show you on the command line, it's sudo at install mu-editor. As you can see, it says it's already at the latest version. So I don't need to do that. The other place you can do it is through preferences. You've got recommended software and it's under there as well. Just stuck the program in, and there we go, Mu Editor. You can install it through there if you prefer. So now, if you've got Mu Editor installed, then you can just launch it from the programming menu. Now, the first time you run this, it will ask you what mode you want to go into. And in this case, we want to be Pi Game Zero. I'm already in that here, but I'll show you. If you click on the mode button, this is the menu that comes up when you first launch Mu. And you can just go back to this anytime. So if you're running a regular Python program, you might use Python 3. But in our case, we're looking to use the Pi Game Zero framework for the graphics programming. So that we're, go we're going to use that. We're also going to be using GPIO Zero, which is a standard Python library, and you could use either if you were just writing code for GPIO Zero. But if the uh, the Pi Game Zero is the overriding factor here, so it launches you into an editor, and a blank screen is the first time. And we could actually run it at the moment, but first thing I'm going to do is just set the appropriate screen resolution. The default is a width of 800 pixels and a height of 600 pixels, which is a little too big for the touch screen. The touch screen I think is around 800 by 480, but we're going to have to go a bit smaller than this, mainly because 
I want to keep this top menu here and there'll be the window decoration of the game, the Pi Game Zero game or program as well. So I'm going to go for a width of 794 pixels just to give a little bit for the window decoration on the side and a height of 410 pixels and you can see that you just put these as capital width and height and Pi Game Zero knows what to do with these and then you need to save it it goes into the home slash pi slash mu code and you give it oh, it's going to call it electronics.py then if you click play it will create as a window that has those dimensions you see that fits quite nicely in this screen that we've got they'll access the main menu and then we can do all our program in this black area here and this can all be done using the touch screen so once you've actually programmed it you don't even need a keyboard connected when you close that it still leaves this running status section open you just click stop and then you get back to the menu uh, main programming area that wasn't particularly attractive it's just a black screen so we'll move on to having a look at how we can change the background for a start and first I'll just create two functions so these are default functions that are included with the Pi Game Zero framework uh, def to define a function and then first one's called draw and the second one's called update these run roughly about 60 times per second and they're just constantly called so whatever you put in here will get called then the draw is primarily used for anything you want to draw on the screen be it images anything like that and then the update is used for handling your code to interact with that so that can be checking status of the ports and we'll just use the draw function at the moment so we'll refer to the screen which obviously refers to the screen that's that's the the black area that you saw when we ran it the first time fill we'll fill it with a color and then we just give it a color uh, as an RGB value I'm going to use 192 192 192 as these are the same that means it's going to be a grey colour uh, if you click play it will save automatically and then play ah. well if I you create a function it must have something in it uh, in this case I just say pass that means ignore that. so we can run that now so that's better so as you can see it's just got a grey background and that's our starting point so now I'm going to look at adding some images to that screen using Pi Game Zero which uses uh, refers to actors as your sprites your images that you're going to pull on and we'll create one of those here first we need the images that we're going to use and I've already created these and these are available to download from my website penguintutor.com there will be a link in the description of this video and these ones I can just turn on some previews the alien ones are default so all the images need to be the program files when you're using Mew it's best to install to save them in slash home slash pi slash mu code which is the mu directory and then all the images need to be in the images folder and they'll get pulled up by just referring to their name you can use full paths if you prefer but this is the simple way as you can see I've just got some basic images I've created of various different things and the main ones we're going to look at in here are buttons 
and LEDs and uh, they're not, not great images. These are just things that I, I quickly knocked up in Blender to use for this demonstration. And we can refer to these just by using the name. So we're going to use if we're going to look at I'm going to use this red button. It's called red hyphen button hyphen one dot png. For this purpose, we don't need the png. Bit. I think now it can be included, but in older versions of Pi Game Zero, you had to not include it. We'll use, create it here so it's outside of the function. So this will be created before we get to the main running of the code. I'm going to call it red button. It's an actor. And file name red button one. And then I'm going to give it the position that we want it to start at. You can move it around because it's intended to be for sprites, although you probably don't move these buttons around so much, but we will be changing the image to show when it's pressed or not. And then we need to draw that. So we need to add it to the, the draw function because it won't do anything on its own. And red button, which is what we've called it, and we call its draw method, which is already defined for an actor and if you just say save play now here you can see we've got our red button so this is something that we can now look at interacting with and it's worth noting if you've not done a graphics programming before the way that generally works and, and it's the game it's in Pi Game Zero is that the top left hand corner corner is zero zero and the bottom right hand corner is your maximum size in this case 794 by 410 so that's the coordinates that we've put in here 150 so that's that's the x value 150 from the left hand side and then 200 200 pixels from the the top what we need to do now is have something so we can interact with that button. As an actor, it's automatically got some methods that we can use. Before we do that, I'll just show you again. So red button one is the one we used. I'm gonna to switch to red button two. It's not that obvious from this screen that button one is quite a bit, the, the center is, is dull and if you look button two the center is bright it actually looks slightly better on the actual screen rather than in this recording so what we're going to do is change the image as we as, as the button is pressed to do this i'm first going to add a variable that's going to tell we can use to store the status of the button that red button dot status equals false. This is actually using object oriented programming. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail explaining that here, but by referring to this dot status, I've just created a attribute to the um, to the object that we've got. Um, as far as program is concerned you just consider this as it has been the whole variable name and that's fine and then we're going to use another one of the functions that is predefined which is the on mouse down it takes two values the position and which particular button is Pressed. Put the code on there. And this will be called by Pi Game Zero, so you don't have to worry about adding any handlers or anything like that. Every time that the mouse button is pressed, or in our case, the touchscreen is pressed because the touchscreen is basically handled as though it was a mouse. 
we're only interested in if the left button is pressed. So we'll just put an if statement there. So if if the button, so that these are filled in by Pi Game Zero, the position will be a tuple representing the XY position, and the button is which particular button of the mouse is pressed, and mouse dot left refers to the left button. I'm going to use collide point. So what this says is that if the the red button collides with the position that we've been given there. So if the button is being pressed and the position of the mouse is colliding over the top of the red button, then it'll call this code. We're going to set the status to true because that's something we might need later. Doesn't actually do anything at the moment other than store the value. And then I'm going to set the image to the second image, which is known as red button dash two. And if it's not, in collision with that, then it's going to be that the red button status equals false and we'll set it back to the image. Set it back to the first image. Save that and play again. And what you'll see is that if we click, it goes on and click else, anywhere else other than there and it will go off. So what we've got now is a virtual button that we can turn on and off and we want to get it to control something. So this is where our LEDs that we've added onto the board come in. So what we're going to do is that when that button is pressed, it's going to turn the red LED on, and then when it's not pressed, it's going to turn the red LED off. So we're using Python and the Pi Game Zero framework. I'll just get rid of that comment there. And we can also call in other modules. In this case, we're going to use GPIO Zero. It's something that I've use quite a lot. It's very easy to use for interacting with the hardware of the Raspberry Pi, particularly the GPIO ports. So import that using from GPIO zero, import button and LED. So these are two types of objects that are available from GPIO zero, a button object and an LED object. And if we import them in this way, we can just refer to them as button or LED. The alternative is you can just import the whole of the GPIO zero library and then you have to prefix them with GPIO zero, but this one makes your code a little bit cleaner. Going to define the, the pin that we've got the red LED connected to. And this is the GPIO pin number not the physical number. So in this case, the red one is connected to pin 22. And I'm going to define a LED object. LED red equals LED, and then the, the pin number. So that's just created the object doesn't do anything with it at this stage. And then we can go back to our on mouse down function and we can add it in here. You can just put LED red on. So if the button 
is pressed, LED comes on, and here LED, LED red, top off. That will turn it off. Play this again, and now as you can see, when I click on, you can see the LED has come on, and when I click elsewhere, it turns off, and as you can see, the LED has come off as well. At this stage, I'm going to do something different to the worksheet and the source code that's provided because I'm using this touchscreen. My previous worksheet that I created a while ago was for a standard screen and had the buttons positioned vertically. Because we're using this smaller screen, you need to be a bit more conscious about that, so I'm going to put them horizontally instead. But other than that, this will be the same. I'm just going to change some of the button positions. So, I'll just stop that and for the sake of time, I'm going to be copying and pasting some code in here, but I will be explaining what I'm adding. So, the first thing is that we've got the red LED defined. I'm going to duplicate that, and we're going to have the green, yellow, and red, and they're the GPIO pin numbers. Then, same as where we've got the red LED, we're going to create the GPIO definitions, I've put a comment in there as well, for the green, yellow and red LEDs. And then the same with the buttons, scroll past. So we've got the green, yellow and red button. And I'm going to just change the position of this. As I said, so I'm going to put these horizontally and I'm going to follow the color of the LEDs on the breadboard, which goes green, yellow, red. So I've put them all at the same Y position. And space them using the X values. I'm going to set the status again. So separate status values for the other two buttons. We didn't actually use those yet, they'll be used later. Now for the mouse down, I'm going to add the code in here, which is the same code as before, but repeating it for the green button and the yellow button. So first, if the green button's pressed, then handle this. If the green button's not pressed, handle that. If the yellow button's pressed, of that and so it's going to change the, the buttons and turn the appropriate LEDs you see that this refers to the turning the green one on and the green one off etc so now should be able to run that Oops. and one more thing I missed is to add that to the draw function as well see I've only got the red The, we need to draw the green. So that's just the reminder that you, everything that you create will not automatically be drawn unless you put it in this draw function and that's what that draw function does. Try again. It's better. So we've got the green, the yellow and the red. So at the moment we're only able to turn one on at a time. 
and as you can see as we turn each one on the corresponding LED goes on so now we've covered all the code needed to interact between virtual buttons on the screen and the physical LEDs that we've attached to the GPIO ports. The one limitation of this is that you can only have one LED on at a time. But another thing is that it isn't quite natural. We're trying to emulate a physical or the concept of a physical switch here and you wouldn't touch outside of the switch to uh, cancel it. So what you would expect to do is to press the button once, it'll turn on, and turn it, press it again and it turn off, which would be like a, a latching switch. So I'm going to look at doing that, and this will bring us onto these status uh, variables or attributes that we created. And the whole point being that by updating this, which we've already included in our co code, we know whether the button is down or whether it's up. So the only change I need to make is, is in here, instead of always changing to the pressed button when it's clicked and changing back when it's not, I'm going to instead look at the, sta the status each time that the button is clicked and set the button appropriately. So just copied and pasted. We'll just look through the first one on the green button and this should uh, should help explain what's happening here. Let's that. So if the mouse button is clicked on the green button then we then look at the status attribute if it's false set it to true and set the button as though it's true and the LED on if it's not false so that means that the button status before we pressed it must have been true then we want to turn the status to false change the button to the Unpress button and turn the LED off. And then we just repeated that for the others. And if we play now, then you can see that we can turn multiple ones on and turn them off by just clicking them again. So this wasn't intentional, but there's a slight bug there. It looks like I haven't updated the red code correctly. So part of programming is just to find those bugs and fix them. Ah, I've missed the line. In fact, I've missed the whole code. That's still showing. Oh what it is. Left the old code in there. So I'd added the red button twice and the first using the new code and then the second was the old. So let's try that again. There we go. So I'll just show you that these do indeed light up the LEDs as well. And that's the virtual button to the physical LEDs complete and next we'll move after this we'll move on to the other way around having a physical button controlling a virtual LED. So now we've got virtual buttons that control physical LEDs I'm going to do it the other way around we're going to have physical buttons with virtual LEDs just to show how you can interact in both directions you can uh, do whichever you want and it gives you a huge amount of flexibility then. So I'm going to start with creating a 
in a similar way to how we created the LEDs. I'm going to start with let's start with the the physical display, uh, the virtual display, and we've already referred to LED reds, so we're going to call this display LED red to differentiate it. So the ones that display LED reds are the LEDs that are on the display. These are actors, the same as we used before, and we've got image files for on and off, just as we did with the buttons. We use the off image first. And I'm going to place these at 300, 300 for the first one. I'm going to put them side by side. I'm going to create both at the same time. This is only two and Remember, these won't actually display until we include them in the draw function. So we'll add them here. And one of the good things about the new editor is it does auto complete, so it can give you hints into the um, names of the variables and things like that. Do that. So now run these and it should yeah, show the two LEDs, so a red one and a blue one. These are the, the dark versions, I've deliberately done them quite a dull colour versus the uh, brighter versions. And these are just very basic shapes created in Blender. Uh, I'll explain later that um, you can create much better images and things like that. So the next bit is to look at the physical side and the physical pins. So like we created these. So the reason for doing it here is because then there's one place you need to go if you have to change the GPIO pins or and it makes it clear which GPIO pins you've used. So that's GPIO pin 2. And three. In my case, I've got the the red cap on pin button one, on the, the the button that's connected to that, and the one with the blue cap to button two. If you've just not got those colour caps, then you just have the the plain buttons for each of those. And then the handling of this goes into the update function that we created earlier but we left it empty. So in this case we just need to detect or check the status of each button and handle that by changing the colour of the LED by changing its image. So if button 1, so this is the red button, is pressed and that will tell you the status of that button through GPIO0. Display LED red dot image. I just realised that I didn't actually create button one as a button. So let's go back up and do that. So just like we had to create these as LEDs, button one is an actor. No, sorry. Button one is a button. With the now we can go back to adding these into the update function. So if button 1 is pressed, set the image to say it's on. 
If not, set the red LED image to red LED. And then we do the same for button two. But using the blue LED. can run that now and you'll see as we press each button the two LEDs will light up. So to add the text we're going to first create the text we want to do, this is, this is going to be a title, I'm just going to put this at the bottom of all these variable declarations, screen title, this is just a demonstration program so that's what I'll call it, and then we can put this straight into the draw function so it's screen dot draw so the draw on the screen and we're going to draw text screen title so this is the title I mentioned earlier you could have just put it in here in quotes so it's usually better to have it as a variable font size so the size of the font obviously center which is the center of the screen roughly so that's going to set position it the center of the text into this position which 400 is roughly the center and 50 from the top I'm going to give it a shadow and give it a colour of 255255255 which is all on RGB which gives you white and an S colour which is the colour of the shadow. Now I could use RGB values the same as colour but just as a demonstration to show there's other ways of representing colours I'm going to use the hash colour format often used in HTML and then that's it so we should be able to run that and as you see it's added the text and added a shadow and that's it so that's the practical worksheet aspect completed and I'll got the, the source code will be linked to in the description. Now we're going to move on to showing some other things that can be done. Once you've learned the basics you can create more complicated interfaces. This one is a bar graph display. It's not actually connected to any electronics but it could quite easily be changed to use the real values based on an analog electronic sensor. This uses the same technique of using Pi Game Zero actors as used in the previous example. Each of the bar graph segments has two different image files, one for off, which is grey, and the other for on, which is the appropriate colour depending upon its position in the bar graph. There is an update graph function which looks at the value passed to it, which could be from a sensor, and then sets an, the appropriate image for each of the 
segments. If a particular position in the bar graph should be off, then it uses the grey image, otherwise it uses an appropriate image file. The data used to display this at the moment is purely random. The name of the file is barcraft.py, which is in the source code. See the description for a link. This video shows the bar graph from the previous example, along with the speedometer style graphical display. The speedometer is slightly different in that it's made up of two images. The background dial is shown as a static image using the Pi Game Zero Blit. The dial is an image file with most of the image transparent except for the arrow. The dial is created as an actor and then rotated to the appropriate position based on the value. Again, this is an example using random values, but this did need some damping to prevent the needle from moving from one extreme to another too quickly. That's less likely to be a problem with the real sensor, but that's something you may need to consider as well. Finally, something completely different. This image is actually the interface for a 3D printed house that I created. Clicking on the snowman will cause it to light up and change colour. Clicking on the LED string will turn the LEDs on and off. And if you click on the chimney, it will turn the smoke machine off, which causes smoke to come out of the chimney in the model house. I'll show you these in a video shortly. This just goes to show what you can achieve using Pi Game Zero to completely redefine your computer interfaces, to go beyond the simple computer style click me boxes that are often used in interfaces. So take a look at the links in the description and have a look at the source code, see if you can come up with a novel interface for your next maker project. I hope you found this useful, if so please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. If you're interested in more maker projects then please subscribe to my channel or take a look at some of my previous projects.